Good evening, I'm Peter Sharoshi, and I welcome you all at uh, today's discussion in our Stories from the Frontlines uh, live video series on uh, Drug Reporter. Uh, today we will speak about how this uh, crisis affects uh, people who use drugs in uh, South Africa. Uh, this video is now live streamed on my uh, personal Facebook page, but we link it to the Drug Reporter page because of some technical difficulties, but we hope that it will not uh, uh, affect uh, uh, affect uh, uh, technically the, the video itself. Uh, I have two guests uh, with me here today from South Africa. Uh, Sean Shelley, the Policy Advocacy and Human Rights Manager of the TB HIV Care in Cape Town, and Julie McDonald, who is uh, uh, the Project and Harm Reduction Operation, Operations Manager at the, at the same organization. Thank you so much for uh, uh, accepting our invitation and being with us today. Uh, how are you guys? Uh, how, how, is, how, is, how is it going uh, with your work and with your personal lives now? Um, well, Julie, yeah, I guess sure. the first one to, to start with that because uh, she's been more in the front line than me. I'm, I'm sort of a little bit behind the front line. So maybe Julie, just give some details. Yeah, so uh, in South Africa at the moment, we're under quite a stringent lockdown. Uh, we aren't uh, we aren't allowed out much at all unless we're going to shops or to receive medical care. Uh, so the only people that are out allowed out beyond that are people that have specific permits to be out and about. So it's been quite a challenge for a lot of people in our harm reduction field to obtain permits and the correct permits to be out there to help in the first place. Um, I've been fortunate enough to to obtain one, and I've been able to work at the what's called the Strandfontein site, which is where they're housing street-based people at the moment. Um, uh, in, there are some other smaller shelters that are also providing services to them and providing shelter for them, but the majority, there's almost 2,000 people now that have been moved to this one site and we're, that's where we're trying to, to access to provide harm reduction services there. Uh, and so, and I, yeah, Sean, go ahead. No, no, so I, I'm, I'm, I think we're all pretty tired at, at the moment. You know, I'm thinking about other people who've been doing work on the front line, like uh, MJ, who's with us at Sandford, and with, uh, he does some work for Youth Rise as well. He's been out every single day He's visiting a lot of the people. I'm thinking about uh, Joss, the trainer, who's been doing some training. Uh, and we've got Professor Marx up in uh, Durban, who's, who's doing a lot of work there, and Michael Wilson and the team from TBHIV Care. And in, in the city of Swanee, um, I've also got an appointment at the Department of Family Medicine. So the community-oriented substance use program up there is basically the only program providing um, medical assistance to drug users in South Africa. And so we've got these three cities with very different responses uh, and very different situations going on on the ground, which is, um, which is interesting. And we found some new allies in the, these uh, circumstances. Strangely enough, in people like the Metro Police, who have really tried to show compassion and have been overruled by politicians at times, um, and in other areas where the Metro Police have, have really assisted as well, and often there's been a, a, you know, a blind eye turned by some of the medical fraternity or um, some of the other NGOs, and, and in fact, the provincial health department or the city health department hasn't been present at all in any of these spaces. Uh, how, how is the general COVID situation in South Africa? Like uh, how, how much the, 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 the infections are spreading and uh, what is the reaction from the authorities? So we, we don't really know. I mean, we know that there are about 1,900 infections. That was the last figure I got. It's, it's actually on the Stanford webpage, which you can't say, um, with I think 18 deaths, correct me if I'm wrong, we, but around there. We, we've gone up to 24 deaths today. So it doesn't appear to be a huge amount of people at this stage. Um, I think that the, the president made the right decision in locking down very early. Um, I, I don't think it was executed brilliantly, but I think the decision in essence was right. Um, I also think that we don't really know because we haven't started our big rollout of testing yet. And, and what we do know is a lot of our population live in very cramped conditions. Physical distancing is almost impossible for them. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that's going to be a problem. And it's, I find it quite ironic that uh, some of the people are breaking the law, which says only 50 people in the space, and yet they're putting 2,000 homeless people, a lot of them with TB, um, 
uh, you know, and other infectious diseases as well into the same space. So I think the problem is we've got a lot of compromised people with HIV and TB, and if this takes off, we're going to see a lot of death. Mm. How is the police uh, in this situ behaves in this situation? Do they still arrest people for drug use? Do uh, do they use any res repressive methods? Judy, I think you can speak to a bit of that because yeah. you were there yesterday. Yeah, I think um, w w there's a bit of a double-edged side that we're seeing. So uh, the police, or I would say certainly Metro Police and the SAPs have been quite supportive. I think they're trying to turn a bit of a blind eye to the substance use itself. Um, certainly outside of the site, we're not hearing about as, as much um, police brutality, etc. But within the site, there have been already instances where flare-ups from law enforcement, they were firing uh, rubber bullets at people that were trying to leave on Tuesday afternoon. So we've already seen that. Um, and, and the site has only been up and running since Sunday. So within the site, I believe there are, you know, there, there is going to be quite a lot of flare-ups. Can you just talk, tell us the story, like how this situation escalated to, to this crisis that, we, that police had to use the rubber bullets, or how did it happen? Okay. If I can just add one thing before Judy answers that, because she was there, I, 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 but seeing other situations evolve like this, I think part of the problem is, is, um, is and, and certainly there is police brutality going on. Um, the people that we've interacted with are really trying their best, but um, that's not everybody. But I think also when you take a group of people who are largely from formerly marginalized uh, populations, who've been brutalized, they've grown up with a lot of trauma, and you ask them to enforce what is essentially an unenforceable thing, because, because you, you just can't contain people where there's no health services, no food, no water, um, no help whatsoever. And especially when you've got a group of people often that are in withdrawal, whether that's from heroin or alcohol or just withdrawal from, from life, you know, they're going to try and make a break for it. And if you try and stop that, there's going to be violence because the police are expecting to do, expected to do something which really nobody should be expected to do. It's not their job. We're expecting them to do social services job. Yeah. But Julie was actually there and saw it escalate, I think. Yeah, Julie. Yeah, so, so one of the issues that, um, was coming up that we were hearing from the people on site was that there were some similarities um, to to incidences in South Africa's history in terms of apartheid, where police were just arriving on the streets, supposedly picking up um, street-based people for testing. I think that a lot of people were told that they were just going to go for COVID screening and testing, and then they would be allowed to leave. Once they arrived at the site, it became apparent that they weren't going to leave and that they were going to be confined to the space. Um, for as long as the lockdown period um, in, in due, it, it, you know, as long as we're going to be in lockdown, which at the moment is until the end of April. And th that caused a bit of uncertainty immediately. There was the sense that they'd been lying to uh, and that now they were detained. Um, and obviously there's the human rights element that none of these people are criminals and yet they're, they're being forced to remain in a place against, well, some of them against their will. Um, and then, as Sean says, there is the... You, the fact that some of the people that were going into withdrawals are very fearful of the withdrawals and wanted to be able to leave to access to access their drugs and the, they were literally fenced in they've got these, these enormous big silver fences around the tents which which contain people um so yeah there, there were people there were three people specifically that had left um, and they they broke down the back fence and and moved into the sand dunes which which are behind the premises and the police then gave chase and two, they managed to capture two of them and the other one literally disappeared into the bush and they were firing, you know, rubber bullets at her. Mm. That's what we saw on the ground, yeah. How was the, the media coverage of that event? Was it highly covered by the media? No, because the media have been, have been restricted in their access to the premises. Um, certainly yesterday they had a good media presence. That, um, on the site, but on Tuesday, when this was happening, there was there was no media on site at the time. Mm -hmm. I want to, yeah, go ahead, Sean. I, I, just also to mention, there was another incident in Johannesburg on the first day of the lockdown, where um, people had their LV stolen from them. There were uh, rubber bullets fired. 
um, I think it's area J of Johannesburg, um, there, there was, uh, we've documented that, um, and uh, another health we were present there uh, have taken good records and, and we'll be feeding that into the, the global fund human rights issues. And that was a particularly violent event. And also we've got videos which would go up on one of the, one of the posts of, people, of police smashing bottles of alcohol, dragging people out of yeah. cars. So, so that kind of thing definitely does happen, uh, as I said. But overall, at, in, in our engagements police have been more positive, but we've got to find a different solution to this. This is not going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is the situation now? Tense. Nobody's really sure what's going on. The, a letter has been written to the president um, detailing a, a lot of the issues because you've essentially got, uh, and, and I'm speaking on hearsay, Julie was there, Mike was there, other people from Streetscapes were there. Um, they, they, they basically got a place where they put people with no services. And, you know, people need that that kind of sense of belonging in a place, and, and there's certainly no sense of belonging. I've been to the site before, and it's a, a lot of sand with scrub on it, the wind howls through there, the poor ablution facilities, and um, it, it makes me mad because because we've got all these empty hotels standing there, and surely that's a better solution. But uh, Julie's aware of what happened yesterday, for instance, when she was trying to um, bring some medications to people working with the doctor, and they were stopped. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was a, that was a huge issue. We, when we'd been there on Tuesday, we had been able to provide medical care to to people that were in one. Um, so on the site, there are three different marqueed areas, each supposedly housing up to a thousand people, between five hundred and a thousand. Um, and the the one we were is managed by a particular organization, and we were providing services to that particular tent. And on Tuesday, we'd been there and we'd been able to access quite a lot of the people that were, were within withdrawals. We were able to administer some symptomatic medication to them. Um, and it had gone fairly well. We we said we'd be back on Thursday, which we went back yesterday. We were at just we were about an hour into doing um, some medical screening and administration. And then the CEO of the site told us that we needed to leave because we weren't operating through the kind of political effect of, well, the city um, of Cape Town's authority. We were, we were coming in as private NGOs. So we had to leave the really difficult, difficult. yeah. yeah. However, we, we had been requested to be there by the Metro Police, um, yeah. we requested our assistance and by the organization that, that threw uh, Julian the doctor out. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a mess, but also, What's interesting for me is the different approach in the three cities. So in Cape Town, people, there, there were only 20 odd people on methadone in the whole of Cape Town on a very small global fund program. Um, and then those people were given take home doses for the full period. Um, in Durban, we had to stop the methadone program and the needle and syringe program. There was no funding for the methadone program. The needle and syringe program was uh, really halted uh, two years ago, and although it's been approved again, they still haven't given the authority to, to start it again. So that was a problem. And Professor Fox and Mark Wilson and TVHRD care working really hard there to try and um, get some relief to people. But then the state brought in a psychiatrist who was wanting to give people methadone for 10 days, which is not a solution because we need to keep people's tolerance up. And and that, but in the city of Swanee, where they had the community-oriented substance use program, they initiated a thousand people, uh, well, nearly a thousand people. Uh, I just need to check that figure because it's changing all the time. Um, in in a week, um, and the problem is that we're going to run out of methadone in the country, and uh, people aren't aren't very really excited about the fact that we're going to run out. We we had a stock outage last year, which was devastating. And again, we're going to get it. And the fact that methadone costs between 10 and 30 times the price of it costs anywhere in the world. So we're trying to use this as an opportunity um, to, to try and, and bring in a different source of methadone. And I, I, my hat's off to UNAIDS and UNODC who have been really supportive in this process. But um, there's a general apathy around breaking this absolute monopoly, unnecessary monopoly on the price of methadone. Yeah, it's very interesting what you say because um, uh, you echo what other harm reduction professionals saying that actually this crisis can be also used as an opportunity to change those, you know, outdated rules we had before and uh, 
uh, monopolies and uh, break down the barriers. So do you think that these changes you can achieve now can be long lasting even after the crisis? It depends. I'm, I'm worried that the biggest death in this whole COVID thing is going to be human rights. Um, I, I see it as an opportunity uh, to come out of it more socially connected. You know, I, I don't like the term social distancing. I like the term physical distancing and social connection, simply because for people to be socially distant uh, creates, even in the language, a sense of us and them. Um, and I think this is a time we really need to be pulling together. And I think we saw that and we saw a bit of that with, with the police really being sympathetic towards the guys in withdrawal. Um, I, don't want to, I don't know what exactly happened, but all I know is some of the guys got authority to go out and um, they weren't so much in withdrawal afterwards. But, um, you know, it, it, it's really an opportunity to, to try and show things up. To, what I was saying to somebody yesterday was that, in fact, this is what we deal with every single day of our lives. It's just been concentrated and pushed into the public face so they can't ignore it anymore. Uh, and that's all it is. It, it's, it's what happens every single day with us. Yeah. It just exposes the inequalities of, in our society, right? And discrimination. Um, uh, so what do you see in the drug market? Do you see any changes like prices going up or uh, drugs are changing? Julie, do you have any information about that? Yeah, so I've been in, in touch with some of the people that uh, mentioned earlier um, and what what we have definitely seen uh, with regards to I can only really comment on the on the heroin um, and what we've seen is where where it was maybe costing 30 to 40 40 rand um, we're now looking at 50 to 60 rand so there has been an, an increase in some of the cities not in all of them um, and obviously there is concern about um, you know a, as the ability to obtain drugs uh, becomes less or as it's less on the market we have the risk of uh, drugs being with adulterants added with adulterants and and the concern that that will will bring you know to the drug using community mm -hmm. um uh, we also ha hear reports about you know increasing uh, domestic violence due to the the quarantine measures does it also happen in, in south africa or you don't see that we haven't, I, I personally haven't heard of that happening yet. I, I think the tension certainly will rise, um, but I haven't heard specifically of it causing a, you know, being a direct correlation to an increase in domestic violence. Yeah. One of the interesting things about South Africa is they've also made a ban on the sale of alcohol and cigarettes during this period, um, which, is, which is purely moralistic in, in, in my opinion. Look, I, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, um, so I've got no, um, no sort of uh, stake in this at all. Um, but I think it's cruel and unkind to do that to people who are dependent on cigarettes, even though cigarettes are, are not the healthiest thing in the world. There are lots of things that people do that are, aren't healthy. And um, the alternative to uh, regulated cigarettes is, is uh, you know, cigarettes that come in on an illicit and unregulated market, and that's dangerous. And already there are people talking about things like how to make alcohol on Facebook and the internet, and uh, I remember at medical school, there was uh, many years ago, there was a group of students who made methanol instead of ethanol. And, and I think four or five of them died. And, and you know, these are the kind, kinds of risks that, um, that take place. Uh, you know, whether or not that, that, that medical student story is an urban legend, I'm sure many people have heard it before. It does happen. Those kinds of things do happen. Yeah. Um, and, and we know that any unregulated drug is much more dangerous than a regulated drug. And to, for some people, the alcohol dependent people, it's, it's life threatening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there, do you experience any shortages in uh, medications, OST, or any other equipment such as masks or gloves? Everything. Everything at Everything. the moment, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got no ST. We, we don't dare initiate more people at the moment because the problem is, is, is we're going to struggle to keep the people who currently on it on it. Um, so, you know, we, we've been trying with tramadol, we've been trying with um, you know, uh, sympathetic packs, and everybody says, oh, don't worry, you know, the, the withdrawals are going to be over soon, but the problems aren't going to be over soon, and, and, and people are going to need their painkillers or their medications or, or just some life relief, and they're going to go out and they're going to 
use again, um, which is their prerogative and their choice. So for me, the number one priority is to maintain tolerance. You know, so people aren't going to overdose when they go out there. And my big worry is um, we've got a large uh, import and trade relationship, especially in animal products, with China. And we know that fentanyl, car fentanyl, uh, those kind of analogs are coming from there into, into other countries. And I'm just hoping that we don't get a, a, a large amount of that because in South Africa, we don't have a lot of direct drug poisoning deaths. It's usually because of people that died from complications due to um, HIV AIDS, uh, to uh, infective endocarditis, septicemia, TB, those kinds of things, and hepatitis. Those are the five big ones, uh, which is terrible. But um, you know, we, we're not seeing adding to that you know, fentanyl and no naloxone really available. Uh, you've got a recipe mm -hmm. for disaster. Mm -hmm. So, so listening to you, I have the impression that at the moment you are you, you are more concerned about the the impact of the lockdown than about uh, COVID infections themselves. Is that a correct? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or you you are uh, concerned about both? We're concerned about both. I, I, I think Judy can can add to this this I think more than I can. So, so from from my side, I'm most I'm very concerned about both, and I think it's the way that they interact with one another is is very evident. Um, just we also have a, another concern, which which a lot of other um, kind of countries in in Europe and that don't have as as badly as we do, and that's our townships have huge amount, or we have huge number of people that still live in townships where they don't have proper housing and they don't have sanitation within their shacks. So you may have three or four people that are living within one shack without a, without a toilet, um, which means that these people are are having to walk to, you know, having to walk and move around anyway um, within the townships where there are thousands of people. And once the COVID virus reaches those townships, um, we've got very small numbers in the townships at the moment, but, but obviously that will grow. And without adequate sanitation, um, and and more toilets available. Uh, we, there's certainly no hand washing facilities in the shacks and things like that. So we're going to see a massive escalation um, it, with the COVID virus once it's in our townships, and that's a huge concern to me. Um, we also have a lot of alcohol dependence in the townships. More, um, yeah. So so they're, they're very much. I think in South, in the South African context, the 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 marginalised people and the people that live in the townships are going to be incredibly hard hit by COVID. Once it, you know, they've suggested to us that towards the end of April we're going to see the real figures starting to rise, um, and I think that's going to be in upper risk areas, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and, and add to that, 166 deaths a day due to TB, tuberculosis, MDR TB, multi-drug resistant TB, and XDR TB as well. Some of the highest mm -hmm. rates in the world, if not the highest, and certainly the highest rate of HIV in the world. So. You, you're really looking at a problem, and already uh, supplies of HIV meds have been disrupted. For example, in, in, the, in the so called safe space in Strandfontein, I don't think anybody's getting their ALVs there. Um, no. And TB HIV care are, are trying to make an arrangement to, to trace people because people have just been lifted up and we don't know where they are. The one thing that the city of Tuani uh, team has been unbelievable in doing is keeping track of where everybody's going to with all these people on OST. With, with people who are on chronic care medications, psychiatric medications, and that, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how they do it, but, but it's, you know, we're also going to go start seeing our healthcare workers get sick. In one Durban hospital, yeah. there were 11 nurses who are sick already. Mm -hmm. uh, a few days ago, I read an article that uh, in the sub-Saharan Africa, the Ebola crisis also had a devastating consequence on the HIV epidemic that, you know, people didn't have access to condoms and uh, ARV mm -hmm. and are you concerned that the same can happen during the COVID uh, uh, epidemic, that uh, the HIV prevention efforts can uh, be diminished or disappear? Yep, there were no condoms on site, were there? No, that was a call. There was a call for that. And then there was, uh, um, I don't know how to say it diplomatically, there was a, there was a concern raised that we, we, they shouldn't be having sex on site anyway, so we don't need to have condoms. Okay. Which was just an absolute, you know, you know, the harm reduction people just shake their heads and kind of think, you know. 
Well, I think any people should shake their heads because they absolutely they, they just, just yeah yeah crazy. Um, uh, do you do you still do HIV tests or do you have HIV tests and? Yeah, I, I think we've got a very big program in the country of HIV testing. Um, yeah. It's it's targeted testing and index testing mainly though at this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the HIV testing, um, it, obviously because of our lockdown, we've got less healthcare workers that are allowed to be out in South Africa doing the testing. We're not supposed to have people on the streets. So the usual cohort of people which we would access to do testing is, is reduced at the moment. Um, but I think the, in, the HAST workers and, and our general healthcare workers that work with um, HIV, AIDS and TB are, are still doing their very best to, to access people during this time. Um, unfortunately, again, at Strandfontein, there were no, well, there were no ARVs available until yesterday. And then I believe they brought in ARVs, but only one particular type, which is the ARVs that are only taken once a day. People that needed other um, variations of ARVs or needed ARVs that they were taking twice a day, that medication wasn't on site yet. So we had, a, a, I know of one particular patient that we saw who'd been there since Sunday, um, and she'd had no access to any ARV medication at all since then, which is an which is absolute human rights violation. Mm -hmm. What do you think when, when, when people like middle class people uh, uh, hear about what terrible things happening with, with you know, marginalized people because of this crisis, does it make, the, make, more, make them more, uh, feel more uh, solidarity or, or is it, is it, does it make them you know, less? Uh, I can say something very specific around that. Um, in, I, I don't belong to our local neighborhood group uh, um, just because I get too angry with it. Um, and, uh, uh, but my, my partner does. And um, <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a set of messages uh, complaining about the homeless people in the area. And they, they live in a small cohort. What's, what's really sad is the fact that the majority of them actually come from families that used to own property in the area and were forced out of the area during the, the apartheid era. So, so really, they're not the, the intruders, you know, and, and we're not talking centuries ago, we're talking, uh, you know, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, and anyway, they, they got rounded up and they got dragged off to, to Strandfontein. And when the reports came out of the uh, rubber bulletin that um, Sonia put on, on her message on and on the, the, the page, you know, the WhatsApp group, she uh, reported this. And somebody said, this is not for, for general national matters, it's only for local matters. And she said, well, all our local people went there. And they said, no, we're talking about community members. And, and, and that just shocks me because to mm -hmm. me, we need to redefine community. Community is a geographical area and anybody who's within that space should be made to feel part of the community. And, uh, and, and it really just upsets me because I, honestly, I see this as a kind of Darwinian process. The, the, the very wealthy are already socially distanced because just by the houses, the size of their houses, the middle class are being forced to be socially distanced now and are moaning about it. And, and the really poorest of poor are actually exactly the opposite happening. They're being forced into a close space with other sick people all together. You know, what for? To see who survives, who comes out by the end. And I think that deep down, there's some people there that say, well, you know, let's, let's solve some of this homeless problem this way. Uh, and it shocks me. Hmm. Julie, do you share this pessimism? Yeah, I think to a large extent. Well, when you initially asked the question, though, I must, I must also just say that um, a lot of um, the more privileged communities are not aware of what's going on. The press, the press has been, there was a bit of a press blackout in terms of access to Strandfontein, certainly on Tuesday and, and Wednesday. Um, then they did allow the press there yesterday, but, but they weren't allowed into, within those kind of caged um, environments, you know, in, in the caged areas. So, so they could see, you know, I, I was saying to Sean, it felt like we were, we were zoo animals being looked at um, by the media on, on the outside. Um, but they couldn't see what was actually going on inside inside of the tent. So I think that the maybe the middle class and the upper class privilege are, are saying, oh, well, this is wonderful. The city's providing services, at least, and the homeless people have a shelter during this difficult time. 
um, they're not willing to scratch the surface that much and have a look at what's really going on, you know, what's really happening there. Yeah. How, how's your cooperation with, uh, with, with, with like city, city authorities and, uh, and politicians in these times? Like, do they listen to you? Do they give you any support? I think I'll let Sean on. <laughs> yeah, it, it depends who it is. Um, you know, there's, there's some people that really want to do a lot. There's some really good people, but the red tape ties their hands. I think that um, in some areas, there's a lot of commitment to doing things, but very few resources. Uh, and there's a lot of just not thinking about it. There's a lot of, oh, this is not my problem kind of thinking. Uh, we, we see that also in, in funded programs in, in particular, where you know people say, oh, my cohort of people are all right. You know, they, they're only interested in their set of figures. Um, and, and I really don't have much tolerance for that. And we see the same in the political structures where people aren't prepared to take ownership and, and to work collaboratively together. Um, I know that, uh, you know, often at top, they're good intentions, but it, it often doesn't filter down. And then in some pockets on the ground, there's some really, really good, work being done by a few people, but then the sort of middle management doesn't listen to them at all. And then there's this, this massive group of people who are just totally ignorant to what's going on. They don't understand, they don't speak to the right people to understand where to place resources and how to place resources. And also there's a, there's a reluctance to act very often. Um, people don't want to make the wrong decision. Um, and it was interesting actually listening to Bill Gates say today that they're building seven factories for, um, COVID treatments, but they know that possibly only two of those will work. But if they wait until they know which two, you know, then, they, then they're never going to get anywhere because then they're still years behind the curve. And so they, they're prepared to spend billions on, on potentially four or five factories that will, will never be operative just to get ahead of the curve. And, and we're not seeing that at all with politicians. They're just too scared to act. Um, and, and, and once again, you know, I hop on the hotel thing because it's such an easy, simple solution that would cost less than anything. But whenever I ask politicians about that, why aren't we doing it? No, because the hotel said, no, well, tough luck. They're paying them out. They're paying for them already. Why not just put the people there? You know, this mm -hmm. is a time when, which needs some uh, good, strong leadership. And if we're prepared to uh, incarcerate people and imprison them, we should at least it, try and imprison them in some level of luxury because they're not criminals. They, they're just very unfortunate people. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned imprisonment. So we know that prisoners are one of the most uh, vulnerable groups uh, during the, the epidemic. Uh, do you have any information about what's happening in, in South African prisons? The prisons here are hugely overcrowded. Um, yeah. they, are, they are incredibly overcrowded. And uh, I hate to think what happens when, when this happens when this breaks out. They did release some prisoners in some areas, um, but they're filling those prisons up very quickly with people who are caught outside, you know, walking their dog or something like that, you know, which, which is, is crazy. The thing that strikes me, which I must just add before Judy can weigh in there, is, is when I met Judy and we started working together um, a number of years ago, I was only recently off the street at that stage. So, so about 12 years ago, I would be sitting in the scrum center, you know? And let me tell you, I wouldn't be sitting there calmly. Mm. I don't think anybody who's got any fight left in them would be sitting there calmly. And so this weighs particularly heavily on my heart because I still would have got off very, very likely being a fairly well-educated white person. Um, you know, the, the less educated, the mentally uh, ill people, uh, the people who haven't had the privileges I, I hate to think how they must be feeling. Yeah. Julia? Yeah, just, in t just in terms of, of statistics, um, the only thing they've released um, in the press so far is that there's been one prisoner who's passed away in the Eastern Cape, in a prison in the Eastern Cape. Um, but, but that's all the information they've released. So I would guess that there's one that has already passed away. There's probably several very ill people there as well. Um, but again, you, you, to get this actual information in South Africa is, is very difficult. Um, you, you know, the, although we have the freedom of speech, um, as, 
as part of our constitution, it, it's not always when it comes to these particular issues um, around, you know, kind of prisoners and substance use and, and street based people. Um, definitely, you know, it's difficult to get the actual facts and figures, but it has been um, widely kind of in the press that there was one prisoner who has passed away in the Eastern Cape. But mm -hmm. That's the fact that I do have. Um, and uh, do you, uh, how do you see the, the response from uh, donors, international and nat national level? Like, uh, do you think they respond to this epidemic? Are there new uh, funding uh, and resources available? I think we've been quite lucky in that our own, some of our own funders have been wonderful and they've been really trying to assist us. Um, I know the IDPC have been incredible. Um, I'm not going to mention some of the others, but yeah, we, we, some of them have been wonderful in terms of saying, right, let me see what we can do. How can we help you? Uh, the actual funders that we work with directly want to help us, uh, but unfortunately, some of them fall into bigger consortiums and, and there's often a gridlock or some bureaucracy at that level in terms of releasing funds. Uh, uh, but once again, it's quite interesting because, because um, some of the large funds like Global Fund, for example, have got a very clear strategic plan and they've authorized distribution of funds. But when you come down to, to, to sort of levels within the country, and I'm not necessarily talking even PR level, I'm talking uh, sort of at um, government level sometimes, which I suppose is a PR, um, there's a, a lack of willingness to commit. But I think this is also about to do with the whole way that the funding system works, where there's so little freedom of movement and everything has to be so uh, controlled that people are scared of messing up. And so they become paralyzed. And they only, so in South Africa, for example, we should never have started with harm reduction services for people who inject drugs. We should have started, they should have got needles and syringes from day one. It shouldn't have been a question, but we should have also offered things like OST and service to people who smoke because we never had an injecting culture in the country but funders only want people who inject drugs and so you kind of um, missing the curve there again and, and I think with, with COVID it's the kind of same thing you know you arrive at a site and you're, you're only allowed to record the people who are injecting drug users or just drug users or sex workers on your records and to me that should all just go away at this stage it should go away most of the time, but but at this point, it, it, it is just irrelevant. And it's the same with, with a lot of the OST. I've, I've just finished writing new OST guidelines um, for the, the COVID situation where we've taken away a lot of the barriers. You know, really, you, you can't give every single person an ECG, but you can take a good history of them. You can develop a rapport with them. You don't need to be drug testing people to check whether they're using or not using you just need to treat them like people and you need to initiate them quickly. You need to have low thresholds, but with due clinical care. And that's, that's what it should be like all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, maybe just the last round of question to you. Like, uh, so what, what, can, what, what can we learn from this epidemic? What should we change in the future? Uh, what do you recommend to, to other uh, professionals, decision makers? Um, for me, it's it's really just to keep, and it's something that that needs to be um, implemented around all healthcare facilities in South Africa, is to keep the emphasis on the patient as a person, regardless of their background, where they come from, what substances they choose to put or not put in their bodies, uh, where they live, what color their skin is, but that every single person receives exactly the same medical care. Um, and that's something that's seriously lacking in our country, um, not just in the substance use fields, I think across generally people are, are stigmatized way too much. And um, we're, I think it's it's come to a, a head now at the site, we're seeing a lot of um, advocacy and, and human rights issues being addressed or, or coming out now that I think it's, it's going to cause a shift um, in the way that, that people are being treated. Well, hopefully it will anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Sean? You know, from, from my point of view, just to answer your previous question better, I think that one of the big things is the restrictions on the way that funding is handled um, and, and the, the lack of speed at which 
funds can be released in this kind of circumstance. So I, I think the big lessons in this are that really what, what people think we need to do during this epidemic in terms of levels of care is what we should be doing anyway. You know, we, we should get rid of these barriers, these unnecessary bureaucratic systems. We should have more unrestricted funding where there's a general goal in place. We should have, um, you know, more community-based programs that don't just look at a person when they're a patient, but look at them before that, you know, and, and offer continuums of care and just, just helping people live better lives and feel like they belong, you know, and if they choose to. And, and there's some people that don't want to. But I, I and and I think that that we need to put money into the communities, keep them in the community, keep the money in the communities, and resource the communities. Because I don't understand why we still need community capacitation twenty years down the track if people have been doing community capacitation for twenty years. You know that money should be owned, run by the community. And, and I think these are lessons to learn. I, I think that if we are empathetic, kind and uh, thoughtful about everybody if we if we stay physically distant and and socially connected and integrated we could come out of this into a better world but i i've got a very pessimistic feeling that the first step will be human rights and we are never going to regain the, the constitution that we've got in south africa or live up to that constitution unless we work really hard at it. Very nice concluding words. I think we can all agree with them. And uh, uh, let's hope together that uh, we will really learn uh, the lesson from this crisis and we will do better after this. Sean, Julie, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, and uh, thank you for those who are watching us online on Facebook. Uh, please uh, follow us on social media and uh, we will keep you informed about harm reduction uh, during this uh, crisis. Uh, and don't forget uh, to stay uh, informed and stay safe. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.